time, so let's stand together and we'll open by singing when we all get to heaven.
other prayer requests that aren't mentioned here. So you just mention them. Uh, you can just uh, pray for all those people you don't know about that need prayer, and God knows, but you keep them in mind. There is a prayer request for our, our young people. And I don't know about you, but uh, uh, I sometimes worry, worry. Uh, people have asked me, Tom, how come you're not getting too fat? Do you, are you on a diet? And I say, no, I just worry. <laughs> Is that a joke? I don't know if it's a joke or not, but uh, at any rate... Um, um, I worry sometimes about my grandkids and just the next generation and just what kind of a nation are uh, they going to be raised in. And uh, uh, I just had to uh, remind them that, uh, you know, we talk about the good old days. You know when the good old days are? They're right now. And 20 years from now, we're going to look back and say, those are the good old days. And so uh, make the best of the good old days today. Uh, so let's pray for our young people and pray for our, uh, our president. I, I think he's still the president, um, but that's uh, another story, I guess. But uh, uh, let's pray for our nation and just and pray for Israel and just what all is going on in the world today. Um, uh, the world needs prayer. Our nation needs prayer. Our people need prayer. And it's important that we never forget that the real cure is the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and without the Word of God and the influence of the Word of God, it really doesn't matter who the president's going to be next. Um, if the Word of God is put on the shelf, that's a good way to put ourselves on a shelf. Um, and that goes for us uh, personally as well. With that, let's uh, open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 2 uh, for our scripture reading this morning. Philippians chapter 2, and we will read the first 11 verses. Philippians chapter 2, if therefore there be any consolation or comfort in Christ, if any comfort in love, if any fellowship of the Spirit if any bowels and mer of mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better or more important than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father." Let's pause for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for who you are, for the fact that you are in total control. You are omniscient. You are omnipresent. You are omnipotent. You are all-powerful. We thank you for that. But we, and we also thank you for your love that you have bestowed upon us. First of all, in sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our substitute, to die in our place, we thank you for uh, the consideration that you've given us. And we thank you that as your children, you have not forgotten us, but you have a plan for us, and you've given us your Spirit, 
And we just pray that uh, we would not grieve that spirit or get in the way, but that we would allow the Spirit of God to work in and through us to bring glory to Jesus Christ. And so we, we pray that that would be true of each of us as individuals and also of the church. And as we think of Christians and fellow believers around the world, of whom many are being severely persecuted, we commit them to you and we just pray that uh, your promises would uphold them and that your grace uh, would be sufficient in times of need. And help us in this country who really physically in so many ways have it uh, so much better than many parts of the rest of the world. Uh, we just pray that we would understand that we would have nothing if it wasn't for you and your grace that you've bestowed upon us. And so we, we just commit uh, ourselves to you and, uh, and our mindset. Help us not to be proud or smug, but to uphold each other in prayer and be thankful for everything that you've allowed us to have. We thank you for this morning, and we just pray that the time uh, spent together would be an encouraging time, a good time, and as the Apostle Paul put it, that it would be for the better and not for the worse. And so we, we pray uh, to that end. And so we commit this morning to you. And, uh, and those uh, names that are in the bulletin, we commit them to you. And others, for whatever reason, that uh, can't be here in person, uh, we just pray that uh, uh, the grace of God would uh, uh, strengthen and encourage them. We pray all this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
All right, we are in the book of Daniel, and last week we looked at uh, uh, Daniel's, well, it wasn't Daniel's dream, it was Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and so in chapter 4 of the tree, and the lessons that he learned. All right, Daniel chapter 4, um, and uh, we have a, a question this morning, and I'll just answer, ask the question right up front. Uh, what is pride? And as we think of pride, uh, I think Nebuchadnezzar can help us out from what we learned last week in Daniel chapter 4. And so as we think of that in Daniel chapter 4, in verse uh, 30, Nebuchadnezzar has this to say, The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom, by the might of my power, and for the honor of my majesty. And so as we think of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and then we think of what he learned at the very end of the chapter, verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways adjust. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Now, the word pride isn't used too often in this uh, chapter, but pride is all over this chapter when we think of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's attitude. And so the first observation we'll make is this, is pride is a sin of the mind. Uh, it's an attitude that we have. Uh, you can't go out and uh, commit the sin of pride. Uh, it's something that we're thinking. And of course, uh, pride can cause us to do uh, you know, other things. But what is this mind, this attitude? And it's the mindset that refuses to acknowledge that what we have is given uh, by God. And so uh, if we took a look back at uh, verse 17 of chapter 4. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent. So there's the purpose of uh, literally disciplining Nebuchadnezzar. And we won't go through it. We looked at it last week. But for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar literally was insane. Uh, he was out pretending to be a cow and eating grass. And, uh, uh, and what's the intent? The intent that the living may know. And the living there is not just Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, the living is all the rest of the people, including us here. Uh, if you're here and you're alive, then there's a lesson to be learned from this. And this is the intent. That we may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it in the basis of men. And so as we think of uh, all that we have is from God, and if it wasn't for him, uh, crops wouldn't grow. Uh, nothing good would happen. Uh, and everything we have, we should be thankful for that. Uh, it's kind of interesting, and uh, uh, now that he's passed on the scene, uh, I don't know about you, but um, the older I get, the smarter my dad got. And I can remember buying, well, we called them tennis shoes in our days. Does anybody remember those days for school, for gym shoes or something like that? And before school would start, we'd go buy tennis shoes, and we'd get in the car, and before we would go, uh, we had to have a word of prayer. And it was to thank God for the tennis shoes. We'd say, well, we don't thank God. We only thank God for the food at the table. And, you know, most of us are pretty good about that. But you know what? God has given us a lot more than just food to eat. Uh, the clothes on your back, the roof over your head, uh, the freedoms we enjoy, everything. Uh, we should be thankful uh, for the grace of God. Uh, so pride 
It's a pride is an attitude that views oneself as the means of accomplishment and the goal of accomplishment. Remember what uh, in verse 30, what Nebuchadnezzar said, this is for my glory. Uh, this is for me. Uh, look what I built, and it's all about me. Pride is mental independence of God. I don't need God. And anyone who says that is full of pride, uh, and anyone who thinks like that is full of pride. I, I can remember when uh, we had... Uh, uh, a governor, uh, the wrestler, who was that, uh, Jesse? And uh, uh, one of his comments was is that uh, uh, church and religion and God, all that is for weak people. I'm strong and I don't need it. Well, Jesse, you might not have been the worst governor Minnesota's ever had, but I'll tell you what, that attitude, that mindset that I don't need God is an attitude of pride. And while you may be no Nebuchadnezzar, you need to learn the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar was taught in this particular passage. And the, if truth be told, we all need uh, to learn uh, something of that right there. And so let's take a closer look at uh, pride. And what we discover about pride is that it's the first and fundamental sin of the universe. Pride originated outside and before man. You know, men are evil and they can concoct all kinds of, uh, of bad things, but pride was here before Adam and Eve were here. Uh, uh, Ezekiel 28. Now let's take a look at Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel is just before Daniel. In fact, Ezekiel and Daniel were contemporaries. And uh, uh, Daniel was taken in the first deportation. Uh, Ezekiel was taken in the second deportation uh, by the Babylonians. And so in Ezekiel chapter 28, we have uh, in the first 19 verses an interesting passage. And we can divide this into uh, two parts. First part is verses 1 through 11. And we won't spend the whole time on verses 1 through 11, but let's just take a look at a few. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyre, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. And of course, uh, many of the ancient rulers, in fact, even into the uh, uh, 15, 1600s after death, the kings in Europe uh, looked at themselves as having a divine right to rule, and many of them looked at themselves as, as gods. Uh, as far back as Pharaoh, Pharaoh was the number one god in Egypt at the time. And so uh, it's not unusual uh, for the uh, leader of Tyre, the prince of Tyre, uh, to say, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Now Daniel, uh, whether he's making reference to Daniel, which he very well could be, or the word Daniel, the name Daniel means God is my judge. Uh, maybe he's making reference to that. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. And truth be told, and this is true of Nebuchadnezzar, as far as people are concerned, uh, they're very capable. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was an uh, architect. He uh, uh, led battles. Uh, he was a builder. Um, he was a very accomplished leader. 
And the people that lived in Babylon had a very nice, in fact, we mentioned uh, uh, Babylon is one of the hanging gardens, is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, was very capable. And so is this prince of Tyre. But as we read through this, um, all the way down uh, through uh, verse 10, uh, it's very uh, clear that he's talking to a man. And, but as we switch and look, verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came, to, came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre. Now, in verse 2, he's called the prince, and many of your uh, 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 translations might have the word leader of Tyre. But here in verse 12, he's called the king of Tyre. And notice the difference. And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Well, the prince of Tyre was never in Eden. Uh, uh, when you think about the garden of Eden, uh, who were the first human beings to be there? Adam and Eve were placed uh, in Eden. And so uh, as we look at this, we see, oh, he's going a little bit deeper, a little bit further than just talking to uh, a, a man. And as we read on uh, in verse 13, every precious stone was thy covering. Uh, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, and the emerald, and the carbuncle, uh, whatever that is, and gold, the workmanship of thy uh, tabrets and of thy uh, pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. And so as we uh, look at this description, uh, verse 13, you were in the Garden of Eden. Uh, verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub, cherub that covereth. Well, that is not a description of a man. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Uh, you were a created being. Uh, you were... Uh, verse 15, perfect. And it also mentions there he was in the mountain of God. Uh, apparently he was around when Moses went up to Mount Sinai and uh, got the, uh, uh, the Ten Commandments for the children of Israel. The uh, Satan was there. And this is who he is talking about. And he says this uh, as we read on. Uh, let me... Uh, uh, read on here. Uh, old, end of verse 16. Uh, he will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And of course, He's talking about the final destruction and defeat of Satan. And so, uh, what does it say? It says this in Ezekiel 28, 15. At the end, it says, You were perfect until sin or iniquity was found in thee. And a question could be, well, what was that sin that was found in uh, this king of Tyre? Well, for the answer, let's turn to Isaiah. Isaiah is, uh, uh, if you go a couple books to the left, just past Jeremiah to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14. And in Isaiah chapter 14, we have another description of what went through the mind of Satan. And in this chapter, he's talking about the punishment that is eventually going to come to the nation of Israel. 
And uh, at the end, or let's see, verse 11, thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy vials and the worm is spread under thee and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? And so what do we have? We've got um, Lucifer, the son of the morning. And we might say, well, who is Lucifer? Well, Lucifer is Satan, uh, translated adversary. He's it's translated the wicked one. It's translated the devil. It's uh, also translated as the accuser. Uh, he's definitely talking not about a man, but about a created angel and apparently the greatest angel of all. Gabriel himself uh, didn't tackle Lucifer. And so what really happened to Lucifer is he got the big head. And, uh, uh, and you know, oftentimes, if you're very accomplished and you are the best, uh, have any of you ever, uh, I, I won't ask, coached? I, I shouldn't ask you women if you've coached, but I suppose you could coach. But have you ever had an athlete who is just head and shoulders above everybody else? And there's a problem with that sometimes. And it's okay that they're better than everyone else, but when they know they're better than everyone else, unless everyone else knows, uh, pride can set in and what you end up with is a big-headed ball hog who looks down their nose at their teammates who think their team can't get along without them. And it hurts the team. And that happens to achievers more often than we would like to think. And the achievement is not the problem. The problem is, what place do we put our place in when we do something that is good or great. Are you with me on that? What is our mindset about that? Well, let's uh, uh, think about Satan. You know, he's described in 1 John, we won't take the time to look there, but he is the originator and practitioner of sin. Where did sin come from? Satan sinneth from the beginning, according to 1 John 3, 8. Uh, he is the culprit. He's the one who introduced sin into the world. Um, Lucifer said in his heart, now let's look at this mental attitude uh, that we describe pride as. And let's pick it up in verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, notice it's internal, he didn't do anything. He's just his self-talk. This is a mental attitude sin. I will ascend into heaven. And we actually have five I wills that are listed here. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation um, in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And so what we find is in those I wills, uh, Satan is thinking, and he's making a decision. And this is the, the decision that he has come up with. It's I, I, I. Uh, how, what did they used to say in earlier generations? I, I, I. I. Anybody remember that? Okay. You know, kids don't say that anymore, do they? But uh, uh, we, you, you, you kind of get the gist of it. Uh, who are we talking about here? We're talking about Satan. And where did pride originate? In Satan's heart. It's a mental attitude that he had. And when we have pride, you know where it starts? It's, it's a mental attitude. It's in our minds, it's in our hearts, it's what we think. So let's take a closer look and see if we can extract some things from, uh, from Nebuchadnezzar and all other places. So what is pride? Well, 
let's describe it very briefly, as an independence of God that centers on self. And I might just say that pride becomes the, uh, it's a total contradiction of what true Christianity, what biblical Christianity is all about. And it starts with the gospel. As you think of the gospel, uh, we have a verse on the wall, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace, and grace means favor, are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest what? Any man should boast. And boasting is pride. It says, look at me. Uh, Romans chapter 3, uh, verse 26. And I'll just uh, very uh, quickly turn there. Well, you can join me. Uh, that, that would be fine. Romans chapter 3. And after the Apostle Paul proves conclusively that all are sinners, that all are continually falling short, he has this to say in verse 26. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of them which, what? Believes believes in Jesus Christ. And we've already looked, when you believe in Jesus, you're believing in who He is and what He accomplished for you on the cross. And then look at verse 27. Where is boasting? Where is pride? Where does self come into this? Answer, it is excluded. Really. By what law or what principle of the principle of works no way but by the principle of faith you see what Paul is saying is this if you had to do something to gain your salvation and it's interesting it's the normal way to think what did when Jesus fed the 4,000 or 5,000 uh, the crowd followed him around the Sea of Galilee. And uh, he said, you're just following me to get free lunch. But I'm here to give you food that is eternal. And right away they think, oh, food that's eternal. You mean I never have to go grocery shopping again? That's for me. And what did they ask Jesus? What should we do to get this. And Jesus said, here's what you do. You believe on him whom I have sent. Paul and Silas are sitting in jail. And there's an earthquake that comes. And the Philippian jailer asked the apostle Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And he was dead serious. And I believe this. That if Paul would have told that Philippian jailer, here's what you should do. You should go home, open your east-facing window, open it up, turn around three times, and fall on your knees, he'd have done it. But Paul didn't tell him to do that. And that is no formula for his salvation. What was Paul's answer? Believe on someone else. You see, dependence on yourself and the belief that you can contribute comes from an attitude that God needs me. And it's a lack of faith because you know what Jesus said? It is finished. Which means there's nothing left for me to do. And I need to get that, that... God has provided salvation for me outside of myself. And pride says, oh, no, 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 no. You've got to do your part. And this is why people always don't have assurance. Because how much do you have to do? <clears throat> well, you just got to keep trying. And uh, hopefully it will work out if your good can outweigh. 
It's, uh, uh, it's a contradiction in how we live the Christian life. And we could look at uh, Philippians 2.5. Uh, we read it this morning. Let this mind be in you. Every day, as a child of God, we need to do what? Depend on someone else. And pride says, well, I can depend on myself because I know what's going on. Pride is always present in legalism. Uh, We just looked at Romans 3.27. A legalistic system says what? Well, here's what you have to do to earn God's favor. And what does God say? There's nothing you can do to earn my favor. And that's kind of hard for us uh, big heads to get the idea that God can get along just fine without me. That there is nothing I can do to improve on the work that Jesus Christ did. Really? Really? That's right. You're bankrupt. And you better recognize that and you trust and depend on someone else. Legalism always has pride uh, attached some way. Uh, uh, Pride finds fertile ground in prosperity. And uh, turn with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And I just want to point something out. Deuteronomy chapter 8, and we'll pick it up in verse 10. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. See the attitude there of thankfulness. And then verse 11 says this. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. Now, one thing we see is the first thing that happens is they forgot the Lord and his judgments and his statutes. Verse 12, lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwell therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God. So he's describing prosperity, and then what happens? Pride sets in. Your heart is lifted up. Now I want you to notice something about this. Prosperity is not sin. Are you with me? In fact, it's okay, farmers, to pray that the yield will be adequate and then thank God when it is. But notice what's happened here. They forgot God first. And when you forget God first, then when prosperity comes in, it's like a seedbed for pride. Are you with me on that? Verse 10 comes before verses 11, 12, and 13. Thankfulness for what God has provided. But if we forget God and don't keep Him in His proper place, when prosperity comes, we'll forget Him even more. And pride will set up and we will be lifted up. And so, uh, be careful. Paul warns people who are rich, be careful that you don't become wise in your own eyes. Nothing wrong with being rich. But be careful. Let me make this observation. Only the obedient Christian has the capacity to handle prosperity. We see it in our own country, don't we? People can't handle prosperity. And if you try to handle prosperity without God, without paying attention to Him, things get out of whack and out of balance uh, so quickly. So quickly. 
Well, let's move on. It can feed on knowledge when love is absent. And there's a passage for that in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, let's, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we read this. And the Apostle Paul says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifies. And if a man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. And so as we stop and we think of what Paul is saying, uh, what he's, in the culture of that day, they had meat markets. And they would oftentimes offer cattle and meat to their false gods, to their images, and then it would go on sale. And they would sell the meat in the marketplace. And here's the deal. You could get meat that was offered to idols at better prices than all these. You could get 50% off. Now, why would you go to this grocery store and pay 10 bucks a pound when you could pay 5 bucks a pound for this meat here? And there's nothing wrong with it. We know that. Oh, yeah, but some priest did some hocus pocus over it. And uh, we know that hocus pocus did nothing. Cook it and eat it and you'll be fine. But you know what? There were Christians that were saved out of the hocus pocus. And their conscience said to themselves, you know what? I don't want to eat any hocus pocus. That's of the devil. And I'll pay 10 bucks a pound and you can have your 5 bucks a pound, but I am not going to eat any hocus pocus. And Paul is saying this, listen, you know what? In fact, he explains it here and elsewhere. I, if it causes my brother to stumble, I wouldn't eat meat at all. Wow. Wow. You see, that's the law of love at work. And as we stop and we think of knowledge being puffed up, but love builds up. And that's the point. I, uh, uh, believe this to be true, that many, many Christians, maybe most Christians, uh, maybe, maybe not everybody, uh, does, don't really have trouble with robbing banks, murdering people, or uh, obvious overt sins. But you know where we do have a trouble? In areas where I have a right don't dare tread on me. I have my rights. And you know what Paul is saying? He says, you know what? In fact, we read it this morning about Jesus Christ. He had every right to stay in heaven. Nobody had a right to tell Jesus, get, get off your duff or your throne or however you want to put it and get down and rescue people. Jesus had every right to stay in heaven. Yet what did he do? He gave up his rights. He humbled himself and became like us so that he could provide for us something that he never needed for himself, but we sure needed it. And Jesus did that. Out of a humble, out of, well, John 3.16 tells us what motivated him. For God so loved us. Wow. Interesting what we have. We also see that pride is a failure to acknowledge God as the source of all things. We're in 1 Corinthians, so just turn back a couple pages to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And here's what he says in verse 7. For who maketh thee to differ from another? 
And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? And this idea of differ. You know, we all have little different talents. Uh, some of you are, are just, you just have an ear for music. Uh, others of you have uh, uh, an aptitude. In fact, I've always admired mechanics who can take something apart through all the bolts and nuts in a coffee can, and then they pull out the right ones without ever doing it. When, when I do things, I have to match it up and lay it because I'd never get them straight. But who makes this different? Paul's asking the rhetorical question. And what have you received that you didn't, wasn't given to you? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? In other words, why are you so proud of yourself when the talents that you have have been given to you as a gift of God's grace? Thank Him. Oh, no. I'm smarter than you. That's our mindset. And Paul is, is challenging that mindset to get Christians to think. Well, um, I, 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 I might just say that uh, uh, what's the antidote for all of this? And as we stop and we think, and we're in 1 Corinthians uh, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I'll just uh, very briefly mention this. Being filled and controlled by the Spirit of God, and when the fruit of the Spirit, and as we think of the fruit of the Spirit, and it's all a package deal, but the first thing that's mentioned is love. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, or 13, uh, verse 4. Love suffereth long. Love is kind. Love envieth not. Love doesn't puff itself up. Love doesn't promote itself. Love does not, verse 5, behave itself unseemly. Love doesn't seek her own. Love is not easily provoked. Love thinketh no evil. Love does not rejoice in sin, but Love rejoiceth in the truth. Love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. Love never fails. And as we stop and we think of love, I might just say this, that love can create in us a heart that gives other people the benefit of the doubt, that doesn't judge. And... Paul points that out. Well, let's go on. I'll just look at some manifestations of pride. Uh, judgmental attitude towards others. Now, to be a proper judge, and we're in 1 Corinthians here, I'm, keep it close, uh, look at chapter 4. And as we look at chapter 4, we read this in verses 5 and 6. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. And it's amazing how many times we hear people look at, remember, love doesn't delight in sin? And yet, what do I do? What have you done? Boy, I would never do that. Can, can you imagine somebody saying that? I, oh, that's beneath me. I would never get involved in that. Has any of you heard that? Ooh, well, I guess we all have. Um, listen, to be a proper judge, you got to know all the facts. Now, God knows all the facts. 
you also have to be able to interpret and discern those facts. And those, that's not always easy to do. And as a, a, in, uh, a fallible human being, boy, we're up against a lot. And furthermore, did you know we're never told to be a judge? You know what we're told to do? To be a witness. We're not told to be a judge. We're not told to be the prosecuting attorney. We're not even told to be a defense attorney. That's the Holy Spirit's job. We're told to be a witness. You know what a witness does? It testifies to things they know to be true. And what do you know to be true? It comes from the Word of God. That's where we're at. Uh, what does pride do? It has an overinflated view of itself. A proper view of yourself comes only from Scripture, and that's what we just read in these uh, verses right here. Let me mention another manifestation of pride, self-degradation. And it's kind of interesting about self-degradation. Um, and we get this thing about, uh, you know, you need more self-esteem. Well, just between you and me. I've never met a kid who has a problem with self-esteem. The whole world revolves around them. From the day they were born, the whole world revolved around their crib. And, uh, and we need to build up their self-esteem. Are you kidding? That's enough. Okay, let me, let me go on. But what does self-degradation do? It's a way of calling attention to yourself. Woe is me. I can never do anything right. And everybody else is, is better than me. And, and, and w w what did I just say? Me, me, me. Woe is me. No. Our focus is on ourselves, And to call attention to ourselves is a form of pride. It's kind of interesting. Uh, a form of pride is somebody saying this. You know, I'm such a terrible sinner that I can't get saved. Really? Are you saying that your sin is bigger than the grace of God? Are you saying that the blood of Christ cannot wash away your sin? Oh yeah. I mean, there's only a circle and only good people, but once you're outside that circle, the blood of Christ can't reach you. Really? You mean, you are so good a sinner that you can outreach the grace of God? Oh, come on. Come on. Self-degradation. I'll just close with a few comments about confidence. Is confidence pride? Confidence is not pride if, and there's a big if there, uh, if some things are true. If it's based on an understanding of who God is. Daniel 3.16. We won't turn there, but remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were confident in the face of Nebuchadnezzar and told him very politely. They didn't call him Neb or anything like that. They said, we don't have to take time to discuss this matter. We know where we stand. We have confidence because we know what God is like. He is able. He will, and if he doesn't, he's smarter than us. We're going to trust him. Uh, he, they had confidence. If it rests on the work of Christ, did you know that you can know you're going to heaven? You say, oh, you know you're going to heaven, but you must think you're pretty good. Uh, that's a typical <clears throat> response. No, I know I'm going to heaven, not because I'm so good, but because what Jesus Christ did for me. He died and paid the penalty for me, and it is written so that I can know that I have eternal life. Do I see myself the way Christ sees me? How does Christ see me? Did you know that 
I actually have some value to God? You say, really? You, you just said you have nothing you can add to God. That's true. I can't add to him. But you know what? He loved me so much, he died for me. Whoa. That should give me some confidence. He gave me gifts and different talents. They all came from God. And you know what? He expects us to use them. So here's the thing. If you have a green thumb and you're a good farmer with that green thumb, you be the best green thumb you can be. You work at it. Does that make sense? Because that gift came from God. Listen, if you're a good cook, he gave you the ability to uh, prepare things without even reading a, a, a recipe book. Then you be the best cook you can be. You, be. you work hard at what God has given you in your gifts. And you know what? You'll prosper. And the book of Proverbs says that. I have value to God. God sent His Son to redeem me. God has blessed me with all spiritual blessings. Wow. Uh, and God is preparing a home for me. And guess what, folks? God is going to come for me and bring me home. Come on, you can say amen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going home someday to a home that God prepared for us. Why? Because God loved us and He prepared the way. Let's close in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank You for who You are. And as we sit here this morning and we uh, understand that it is our tendency to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. It's our tendency to judge others. It's our tendency to, to pretend to know when we really don't know anything. We pray that we'd be thankful and that we would go to Your Word and learn the proper perspective. The proper perspective of who You are, what You can do, and also the proper perspective on how, what we are and what we can accomplish. And so we thank you that you've given us your spirit and you're willing to use earthen vessels to accomplish things that bring honor and glory to God. We thank you for that and we pray that we'd be willing to be used in that way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's stand and close with the last verse of He hideth my soul. Thank you for coming. Next week, it's Daniel chapter 5, the handwriting on the wall. Uh, and in the meantime, remember this. It's not about what we can do for God, but all about what He has done for us. And what did He do for us? He sent His Son to pay the penalty of our sin. 
Thank you. You're dismissed.